want to do today is probably too much, uh, but uh, so I want to kind of provide a general framework for indoor air quality because a lot of people don't have that. And then I want to kind of own in and talk about some of the specific issues we saw with indoor air quality here. That's kind of woven in throughout. So I like to start with two things. The first thing is time. And so a bunch of numbers on the screen. These are not updated for COVID. The life expectancy of an average Canadian is 82 years. Of that, we spend 73 of our years inside buildings. Uh, one uh, environment that's particularly important is our home. We spend about two thirds of our lives uh, inside, of our, uh, inside of our homes. And uh, so things that happen in the residence, and you'll see, I show some amount of residential examples uh, throughout this because it's a very important environment. Even within the environment, the kind of sleeping micro environment, uh, we spend about half the time we spend in our home, uh, in the uh, uh, inside our, our sleeping area. And so you can think about things like flame retardants in a mattress or um, uh, uh, other uh, emissions uh, in local areas being very important. And I always mention that, you know, we spend a lot of time in vehicles too. So if you're an average Canadian, you'll spend four years of your life in a transportation either a public transportation area or a vehicle. So, so we couple this massive amount of time uh, with a whole bunch of sources inside. Some of which, you know, you probably know about cooking is an enormous source uh, of pollution. Things like cleaning products and other consumer products are important. Uh, any type of combustion, the cannabis, cigarettes, uh, candles is a big source. Uh, and even just walking on a floor generates a plume of, of pollutants. And if I were to keep going with sources, we'd be here uh, all night because uh, there are so many different sources. So you take that big amount of time all of those sources, and you get these very, very large exposures. And, you know, we've been thinking about indoor air quality for pretty much as long as we've had buildings. And uh, uh, we also know how to improve indoor air quality. Uh, there are kind of these four things listed here, keep it dry, source control, ventilation, and air cooling. And I want to start by making the point that this isn't really new information. Um, so, uh, not asking you to read this, but this is a passage from Leviticus and the Bible, and it talks about what to do if you have uh, mold growing in your house. And uh, uh, it basically, uh, I show this for two reasons. One, because it shows just how old, you know, or how long people have been thinking about indoor air quality. But the other reason that's kind of funny is that, you know, the field of mold remediation has not advanced dramatically in the past few thousand years. It's pretty much could repl replace priests with mold remediator. And this is pretty much what we do today. Source control or getting rid of sources is also really important. This person is uh, Dr. Pettenkofer. He was a German chemist uh, and was kind of generally regarded as kind of the great grandfather of the modern study of indoor air quality. Uh, and he has lots of pithy quotes like the one on the screen. If there's a pile of manure in a space, don't try and ventilate it, uh, remove the manure itself. And of course, source control is great, but it's easy to say it. It's very hard to do in a lot of cases. So we do have to think about ventilation. Uh, these two individuals are Catherine and Harriet Beecher Stowe. Uh, they wrote a best-selling book in the 1860s uh, and 70s uh, in the U.S., uh, called The American Woman's Home. It was about the domestic realm. And uh, it's a lot of stuff that you would expect in a book about the home. But uh, I put two of the small chapter summaries there. Uh, a Healthful Home is about indoor air quality. And Scientific Domestic Ventilation is about how important ventilation is. And, you know, this is people were thinking about this enough that this was a bestseller. And there's lots of good quotes in this book about you know, how important indoor air quality is, uh, as well as, you know, how important ventilation is. Uh, uh, how many thousands are, are uh, victims to a slow suicide and murder, chief instrument of which is So this was, you know, 150 uh, or more years ago, uh, people knew this. I'm going to talk a lot today about filters, uh, uh, one aspect of air cleaning. Uh, this has kind of a not quite as long a history. We've used filters in industrial contexts for, you know, a little over 100 years. Uh, 
but the thing I always like to point out here is the history of kind of modern filtration, uh, a standard I'm going to talk about a little later, ASHRAE standard 52.2, if you've heard about MERV, uh, 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 MERV uh, values for, for filters, uh, that's where they come from. That standard is going to turn 25 later this year. So it's really much more modern than many of the other things uh, uh, I talked about. But I mean, having said that, I think you know, everyone understands the idea of a filter. You have polluted outdoor air that comes in, or you have polluted indoor air, uh, and then a filter works by a variety of mechanisms to remove uh, uh, particles, especially occasionally other things from the air as well. Uh, and then uh, that filter gets dirty, dirty enough that you, know, you can often see the dirt on it. One other comment I like to make in this kind of introductory part about indoor air is to talk that we also have a pretty big equity issue. So the photograph on the screen is uh, 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 filters from the same multifamily social housing uh, tower in Toronto, uh, nine different apartments. The one with green tape is a blank filter uh, that didn't have any air go through it. And we ran these filters uh, uh, in an air cleaner for a week in each of these apartments the same. And you can see that you don't need to be an indoor air quality expert to see that different people are getting exposed to different things. So the dark brown uh, and, and to a certain extent, the lighter brown filters, that's environmental tobacco, cigarettes. Uh, uh, and the other ones, the kind of more gray in color that are lighter, that's kind of general background uh, stuff in indoor air. But you know, again, this is one building in one location and people in different apartments have very different indoor air. And uh, it's got a, 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 you know, kind of a darker side to it. The, the data in the graphs are some measurements of flame retardants, which are things that we add to products so that they uh, burn uh, not at all or more slowly. Many of them are associated with a variety of relatively serious health effects. Uh, and phthalates in the bottom graph are things we add to plastic to make the plastic workable. Again, uh, associated with a variety of health effects. And the blue bars here are from uh, a big study we did of Toronto community housing uh, towers. Uh, and the, the brownish orange bars are from uh, homes that were tested at the same time with the same method, uh, but were um, uh, higher income, mostly single family homes uh, in, in, in GTA. And you, know, you can see it's a log scale. Uh, and you can see that for almost everything, we looked at in these two classes of compounds, you see much higher concentrations in the social environments. And you see this over and over again in indoor air quality that there is a difference in how much different people are being exposed to. And I think that's a challenge that I'll, I'll return to uh, at the end. The other thing I like to do when talking about indoor air quality is talk about some of the myths about indoor air quality, both because these sometimes generate some interest and some questions, uh, but also because there are so many myths, so many stories we tell ourselves about indoor air. So an example of a myth is about green building materials. I think most of us would think, oh, green building materials are good. And let's talk about paints, uh, because uh, you know, paints are used in almost every uh, uh, indoor space. And uh, uh, you know, they're one of the most important uh, architectural uh, coatings we use. And if you ask people, oh, what paint should I use? A lot of people tell you, well, use a low VOC paint. VOCs are volatile organic compounds. Uh, and low VOC paints smell less, they emit less VOCs, and they dry much faster. Seems great. However, if you look at the actual literature on these paints, um, uh, uh, they, they overall emit less VOCs. They're emitting VOCs that are potentially much more dangerous for our health. They also emit another class of compounds called semi-volatile organic compounds, which don't fit the definition of VOCs, uh, but can be quite serious to our health as well, at least some of them. Uh, and then you also see a lot of kind of poor uh, ventilation recommendations saying like, hey, you can paint with the windows closed, uh, uh, like the picture uh, uh, down there, which is really a horrible idea. For so if you uh, uh, ask people, well, what's a really green uh, uh, paint to use? Uh, people will tell you no VOC paint. And a no VOC paint, uh, they've been on the market for 20 years or so. Um, and they typically have some type of base like a linseed oil, which if you're 
familiar with chemistry is an unsaturated compound that loves to engage in chemistry, particularly with oxidants that can come, for example, from outdoor air. And there's some research, uh, uh, both of the papers I cite here from Denmark, that show that, uh, that when you use a, a, a no VOC paint, um, you're actually leading to some chemistry that leads to particles and a variety of other compounds. So that's not really a very good solution either. So I usually get asked, well, what should I paint with? And this is what we do in my house when we need to paint is uh, paint with an ordinary latex paint and uh, wait as long as you can uh, before occupancy. So the ideal thing to do is to, uh, if it's at all possible to not live in the space for a couple of weeks at least um, to let the most of the off gas occur. The other thing I was giving this to, to some architects and one of them pointed out the other solution is to use materials that don't need, which is a great suggestion as well. Another myth we tell ourselves is that plants are good for indoor air quality. And uh, uh, the text there is from uh, David Suzuki Foundation, uh, their website, they've since taken this down uh, by the way, uh, but they talk about how much plants can improve indoor air quality. And this is kind of very, very appealing, right? We think about plants and trees as cleaning the air. And so it seems like that's a great thing for indoor air. And you see that shown in different ways. Uh, uh, one of the pictures there is from uh, uh, one of my uh, former students uh, right in the lobby of her building. They had this sign you know, about, uh, uh, you know, have plants to breathe easier. And all of this stems from this paper that's at this point over 30 years old, uh, a father and son team, the Wolvertons, uh, uh, the elder Wolverton worked for NASA and did these experiments uh, while, while they were at NASA. Uh, uh, and sorry for the quality of this reproduction, but that's the best quality I've ever found of it. And uh, uh, they showed that if you put plants in a, in a chamber, you will see drops in concentrations of volatile organic compounds, things like formaldehyde, which is an irritant and a carcinogen, something we definitely don't want in our air if you have plants. Um, and the problem with, with this research is that it was fine research, but it was done in a sealed chamber. And our buildings are anything but sealed chambers. And so we have things like ventilation and background loss and so on. Uh, and so uh, uh, more recent research, this is a review paper uh, done by, uh, uh, among others, Michael Waring, who's a, uh, one of my first PhD students from a long, long time ago. Uh, and uh, uh, they did the study that looked at, you know, all the literature they could find on potted plants and how much they remove VOCs. And what you see on the bottom axis there is the clean air delivery rate, CADR. I'm going to talk more about it a little bit later today. But just to give you a sense of scale here, a decent air cleaner would have a clean air delivery rate that would be probably two, maybe even three order of magnitude over to the to the right on this scale. So it's really not um, uh, sorry over to the to the get to the right. get turned turn over to the right uh, 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 on the axis. And so these plants aren't doing anything. It's really like almost like you don't have a plant there. And this has been shown uh, uh, over and over and over again in research. And of course, it's more complicated than that. Plants definitely make people feel better. There's a bunch of social psychology and other experiments. Uh, we've done some myself in my classes uh, that people really do prefer plants, uh, but they're not cleaning the air. Uh, it's probably mostly a visual or, or maybe some other response. And like everything in indoor air, it gets even a little bit more complicated than that. Um, uh, you know, I think with COVID, we've become a little bit more sensitive to those in our population that might be immunocompromised or otherwise a little bit sensitive. And so these are two papers uh, from the literature uh, from uh, uh, one is what, 30 years old, more than 30 years old. The other is, is uh, a little less than 20 years old, than 15 years old. And they found very serious cases where people got infected uh, as a result of uh, uh, fungi that came from either the soil the plants were, were, were in or the water the plants were in. And the top paper here by uh, Richard Somerville is why when you go into certain wards in Ontario hospitals, they no longer allow the plants uh, because uh, they can't be quite a serious issue. 
So it kind of goes, we started from, you know, plants uh, improve indoor air, and it turns out not only do they not improve indoor air, they might be harmful to some members of our population, but they make people feel better. So it's a, it's a more complicated story. Another story that I never even thought about 10 years ago, uh, do people know what an essential oil user is? Yeah, so they're a little humidifier, essentially ultrasonic humidifier. Uh, you uh, put water in, you put your favorite essential oil scent in them, and they make the room smell nice. Um, and we first came across them in a condo in downtown Toronto. We did this study of filtration, not at all having anything to do with essential oil diffusers, but sometimes you find stuff that you didn't intend to. And so the person who lived in this condo, um, the uh, long story short is that uh, every night when they uh, uh, went to sleep uh, at about uh, midnight or so, uh, they had an essential oil diffuser that ran on a timer. They were using mostly for actually humidification, a little bit for, for set uh, purposes as well. And we saw this massive burst in particles and it ran on a timer for about three hours and then it, it shut off. Uh, and we would see this, we measured in these homes we were doing the study in for a year. And so we saw this pattern every single night that they were there. And, and so it, it's this, you know, you don't see a source like that. That's amazing in terms of how much stuff it's giving off. And, you know, th these things are, 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 you know, relatively simple. You can get them for a few dollars. Again, just a little ultrasonic uh, 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 piezoelectric uh, uh, actuator that makes the, the droplets and that puts them into the space. So we got interested we started doing two things. One is we did a bunch of chamber tests where we measured the emission uh, of these uh, and we tried different oils. And the top plot there, we used ultra, ultra pure water. So there's nothing coming from the water, uh, uh, just from the oil itself. And you can see different oils give off different amounts of, of particles. But the, the, the grapeseed and the lemon oil, that's roughly competitive with the cigarette in terms of mass of particles. Really quite a serious source. And then we took the eucalyptus, which was a relatively low emitter, and then uh, ran it with you know, very pure water and then ran it with out. And you see a massive increase in, in what's being put out. Again, that's because of, uh, uh, of minerals in the water that show up. Uh, and depending on where you've lived, you might have seen the kind of white stuff that accumulates around ultrasonic humidifiers. Uh, that's minerals in the water that are put into the air, quite, actually quite harmful. The other thing we did, and this is kind of a thread of my research that I'll just mention, is that we like exposing people to stuff and measuring what's going on in their brains. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we learned by exposing people to essential oil diffuser emissions is that they make more impulsive decisions. So when you go into a store and you can tell that there's a scent being added to the air, one of the reasons the store does that, there's a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is to make people spend. Um, so this is kind of well known, I think, in the in the kind of retail community. Uh, uh, and so again, it's an idea, something we do because we think it's good, uh, but maybe not so much. There is in this world a lot of uh, uh, what I'm going to call alternative or unproven air cleaners, uh, and this goes back many many years. I have an example from 1896 in my files of an air cleaner that's uh, uh, being sold to improve the air. And there's a lot about these air cleaners that are kind of very, very sketchy. Often they show very high efficiency results, for example, but they achieve that by testing it absurdly low uh, ventilation rates, or they do testing in a shoebox and show, look at how quickly it cleans the air. But of course, that doesn't matter when you're in a big room. Uh, uh, and then they do a lot of other things to kind of play with the data. And during COVID, these go through waves. I was involved in a bunch of lawsuits 20 or so years ago uh, when there was a wave of them, and then COVID has made another wave of them. And so we saw a lot of headlines like this one during COVID. Uh, this, was, uh, this was when uh, Trump was, was running for uh, 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 to be president in 2020 hosted an event, this is kind of in the early months of COVID in Arizona, and the church said, we're just hosting this event, don't worry about it, we've got this air purifier, it kills 99% you know, of COVID, and started with that claim, that claim was 
demonstrably false and ended up with a company company under investigation by the Arizona Attorney General for false advertising. So we see this over and over again. What I always tell people about air cleaners, like like the ones that are that are kind of being mentioned here, is you can't have an air cleaner that works. You can either emit enough in the air of whatever you're emitting, ions, hydroxyl radicals, ozone, uh, to make a difference to, to, to microorganisms or viruses in the air. But all that stuff is harmful to us too. And so uh, it, it starts to, to harm us. And so this is an example, oh, I didn't put the reference there. It was from a paper in, in China uh, where they tested negative ion air cleaning devices. And they found eh, they did lower the particle concentrations a little bit, which is good for health, but all the ions they put in the air were causing more harm to people than the benefit from particle concentrations. Uh, uh, and then the other thing, which I think is most of this class of air cleaners, they don't emit enough to make a difference, uh, but then they don't have any performance. So you can't have it. You're either emitting enough and they're dangerous or they're emitting not enough and they're not doing anything. The, that's the, the kind of possibility here. The last myth I wanna talk about is, is one that's a little bit sensitive, but that gets to um, uh, something we saw a lot during COVID is that we have public health authorities that are not trained in indoor air quality a lot. So this showed up first in, in, in what I call the five micron elephant in the room. Uh, and so there was this whole discussion at the beginning of COVID that, that, that COVID was not air. And it comes from this idea in the medical literature that a particle, it's five microns, and just to give you a sense of scale, a human hair is 50 to 100 microns in diameter. So this is you know, so small, there's lots of them all around us right now. Five microns is big enough that it'll settle to the floor with gravity, and uh, uh, and that is just bogus. Like I don't know how to say it. Like that assumes that first of all the air is still, and I can having made many many velocity measurements inside buildings, it's never still. And in fact, a five micron particle can travel great distances. Whatever I tell people, uh, whatever I tell people, think about this is if you've ever changed the filter in your life. That filter has got a ton of dust on it. It's so big, probably millimeter scale or bigger that you can see. And it made it all the way to the filter through 90 degree bends, other things. And uh, uh, so, so a five micron particle can travel great distances, not to mention respiratory particles. This is a nice picture of a sneeze. Uh, uh, if we can see the droplets in the sneeze, we'll travel for long, long distances, several years. Uh, and um, for the same reason the clouds float in the sky, which are also water droplets, are the same reason a sneeze will travel long distances. It's kind of warm, moist air that can suspend those droplets and carry them long distances. And so, um, so we had this airborne myth that our, our public health authorities were telling us. And then there were other parts of this as well. So for example, this is a paper I wrote with some uh, colleagues in public health and some others where we uh, did a big literature review and showed that, at least in Ontario, public health authorities were giving different guidance to, for example, schools than they were to things like homeless shelters and, uh, and group homes and long-term care uh, and so on. And so uh, uh, even when they you know, started to talk about indoor air quality, they were only giving that information to some. And then another thing that showed up a lot is uh, people saying things like filters don't work. And so we did another review of the literature, and sorry, it's so small here, uh, but where we show that uh, there is plenty of evidence, both direct and indirect, about how uh, important filters can be to reducing exposure. And so unfortunately, indoor air quality is one of those things that I would say in most places, public health authorities are catching up to it um, rather than understanding. Okay, I wanna dig into some details about indoor air quality and about filtration and ventilation specifically, but I wanna start from this Swiss cheese model, which hopefully you've all seen before, that there is no magic here. Uh, filtration and ventilation and other things we might do at the building scale are a layer of protection. They're all imperfect. I'm gonna talk about some of the imperfections of the things I know well, but everything is imperfect. And so the idea is that you have 
uh, many of these layers, or you need to have many of these layers because they all have holes in them. That's the Swiss cheese part. And you want to stop the virus from getting through from an infected to an uninfected person. The other thing I think to say that's really important here is that, you know, given some of the disparities in indoor air quality, we really need to think about the risk in the space. And from an infectious disease perspective, you know, environments that are crowded, environments that are not well ventilated, environments where people are speaking, especially speaking loudly, environments where people are eating, so obviously they can't wear masks even if they want to, uh, 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 occupational activities, taking on and off PPE, for example, in a hospital is still today the highest concentrations of the virus I've ever seen in the air, is in an area where doctors in a hospital in Wuhan were taking off uh, their PPE. Uh, and that caused a lot of particles to come into the air. Uh, and then, of course, you have to think about who's in the space. I care a lot more about the individuals in a long-term care home than I do about uh, uh, people in the university. Not that people in the university might, uh, 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 might you know, they're deserving of protection too, but they're uh, uh, much more likely to be susceptible to disease uh, as you get to uh, elderly populations. So uh, when I talk about, uh, uh, just to be clear on terms, ventilation, I mean fresh air coming from outside. When I talk about filtration, I mean air that is recirculated from in the space, but put through a filter to remove uh, infectious particles. And, you know, I said this a second ago, it's worth repeating again. These are not, I'm going to talk about them in great detail, but I'm not saying they're magic. They're not silver bullets. They don't slay COVID. They are one more layer of protection. Uh, and I would say they're a layer of protection that we don't use enough. So just to show you that they work, these are two very early uh, data collection efforts from, from COVID. The first one I've shown here is from a bunch of schools in Georgia, in the US and Atlanta area. And uh, what you see here on the y-axis is the uh, likelihood of people getting COVID. And then the schools are divided into four bins here. Schools that said they did nothing, schools that said they improved ventilation, schools that said they improved filtration, or schools that said they did both. And you can see there's a lot of variation. This is not very detailed data collection, but you can see that the risk drops to something like 60% uh, of what it would be without these measures, a little bit more if you do both uh, simply by doing these things. So that's epidemiological evidence that it works. Um, this is a plot uh, come, came a little bit later in COVID. The research was done in 2021, uh, where the researchers um, uh, took populations of infected people, put them in a chamber, and then uh, did, did two uh, types of experiments, one with a HEPA filter and one without a HEPA filter, just to look at the concentrations of virus in the air. And if you're not used to looking at qPCR results, uh, uh, it's a little confusing because the bigger the number on the y-axis, the less virus there is in the air. You can kind of think about it as how much you have to amplify things to see if there's any virus in the air. And so with a HEPA filter, you can see that uh, uh, on average, there was uh, 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 much less virus uh, in the air, suggesting you know direct evidence that filters can reduce the virus. So we also know from other diseases. This is an article that Hugo Lee, who's one of the kind of great minds on, on infectious disease and ventilation. This is a review article that he led uh, a long time ago, and this was long before COVID-19. And you can see that, that, that uh, uh, they found that for all the diseases they looked at, uh, the more ventilation, the better in terms of reducing disease transmission. We don't really have enough data to say, this is how much you need to ventilate. And I'm gonna to get to that much later. And I think we maybe have a little bit more information now, but the short version of, the, of the, the, the answer is more ventilation is better. And so you might be familiar if you're in the world of ventilation that uh, ASHRAE standard 62.1 is the ventilation uh, uh, for uh, and now ventilation and acceptable indoor air quality. And uh, uh, this is the standard that most of the world follows or some close variant of it for setting ventilation rates. 
And basically, uh, the central part of the standard is this huge table uh, that goes on for many, many pages. I always like to show correctional facilities and educational facilities together. Uh, uh, and uh, basically, based on the number of people in the space, as well as the floor area of the space, you provide a certain amount of information. There's two points I want to make. The first point is really important. The, the table explicitly include, uh, excludes infectious disease risk. This is ventilation for acceptable uh, indoor air quality, which means that 80% of the people in the space will say, hey, yeah, air quality seems acceptable. It also means we're probably controlling major health risks, but there's not a lot of specificity there. And so, you know, this is not really for infectious disease, although this is a really good start. The other comment I'll make is that this is for commercial buildings. There are other standards out there for, for 622 is for residential building and 170 is for uh, healthcare facilities. So one thing we can do in not in all buildings, but in many buildings is we can certainly uh, bring in more outdoor air. So we can adjust dampers uh, in the building and bring in more fresh air from outside and that will reduce the risk of the virus. Uh, and, you know, this is the real world. There are challenges with doing that. Some places in the world, outdoor air pollution is a challenge. Certainly we have a climate crisis. Energy can be a challenge as well. Uh, maintenance and commissioning. Uh, if you bring in more outdoor air, you've got uh, probably, uh, uh, you've got to spend time making sure your dampers work uh, uh, and, and making sure that the system uh, can, can, can adjust to that uh, extra air. And depending on the conditions outside, you might have comfort and especially humidity control issues with bringing in more ventilation. And, you know, I know that some of you are in the world of HVAC, but uh, a, a lot of people are not. And so the vision that I think a lot of us have for HVAC systems is that they're carefully designed. People are thinking about comfort and indoor air quality when they're designed. They're installed and maintained by professionals and operated in an energy efficient manner. That's you know, true sometimes, but not usually true. Uh, instead, I like what's in the box more. I think that's probably more accurate for a lot of systems. Uh, you know, they're designed using rules of thumb. They're installed by the lowest cost bidder. Um, often, uh, a lot of buildings don't have the resources to maintain them. And usually you see some pretty major control and operation failures. So it's easy to say increase ventilation. How much it's actually possible depends a lot on the details of the building. So let's talk about filtration. When I talk about filter, a lot of people like to talk about the filter itself, and I will talk a little bit about that, but I think we really have to think more broadly about the context of the filter. And I think about that in three bins, airflow, efficiency, and effectiveness. So first let's talk about airflow. Uh, this is some uh, data from three different parts of North America, uh, uh, different studies, different methods, uh, and the, the value you see on the y-axis here is the recirculation rate. How many uh, uh, home volumes of air are going through the system when it operates? And you can see that in some of these homes, it's less than two volumes of air per hour. Other homes, it's more like eight volumes of air per hour. So right away, there's going to be a big difference in benefit of, of uh, the same filter in different homes at the extremes. The other issue is runtime. Uh, uh, runtime is the fraction of time that the system operates. For many residential systems and, and even for some commercial systems, a, the, the system only operates when there's a need for heating or cooling. Uh, and so you see that uh, the runtime, how often a system operates uh, as a function of outdoor temperature, and this is for about 7,000 homes. Each dot represents a month of, of average uh, for the two quantities shown. And there are two reasons I like to show these data. One is that you see this, um, you know, you see a little bit of structure to the data. Systems tend to run more when it's hot or cold, uh, uh, which makes sense because of heating and air conditioning. You also see a lot of variation. You know, there's no kind of one runtime. But the actual most important part of this picture is that red dashed line. That's the median runtime. It's about 18% uh, uh, in this very large study of homes, which means about less than 20% than, 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 uh, uh, of the time, air is going through whatever filter you have in the place anyway. 
And so, um, you know, thinking about this airflow piece is really important because obviously a filter has to have air to make it. Uh, next, let's get to the filter itself. So uh, all filters have what's what's called this classic U-shaped curve. And this is uh, confusing uh, to a lot of people if, if, if it's the first time they've seen it, because most people would think, well, a small particle is harder to filter than a big particle. And it's in fact the U shape. It gets, gets easy as the particles get quite small. And the reason for that is when we start talking about particles that are so small, like uh, uh, 0.01 microns or so, they're not that much bigger than, a, than the oxygen and nitrogen molecules that are in air. And they get bashed around by lots of collisions from those, those oxygen uh, and nitrogen molecules. And then some of those collisions will end up in particles depositing on the filter. It's called Brownian diffusion. And so uh, uh, this is a relatively decent filter uh, depicted here. It's from an old paper on filter efficiency. Uh, but you see that small particles get removed by Brownian diffusion, and then big particles get removed by things like uh, inertia mechanisms. They don't have enough, uh, uh, they have too much inertia to kind of go around the filter fibers and end up getting stuck with them. Well, the reason I show that is, is the, the MERV table. So this is from uh, ASHRAE standard 52.2, the major filtration standard we use in North America. And if you've heard about MERV numbers, this is the table they come from. And so as the MERV number gets bigger and bigger, you see uh, uh, higher and higher efficiencies for different size particles. And so uh, a lot of times we were using MERV 13 filters or we're supposed to be using MERV 13 filters uh, uh, during the pandemic. And so those filters would remove 85% uh, or more of the particles that were one to three microns, which in my opinion is the size of particles that are most likely to carry infectious virus. Um, so, so that's the MERV table. And it would be nice if the story stopped there, but it doesn't. If you actually go out and measure efficiency in buildings, so this is a the very same MERV 14 filter, same manufacturer, same filter. We installed it in 20 homes in Toronto. Each symbol is a different home. And we measured the efficiency of the filter actually in place, what its actual efficiency is. And you can barely see it, but there's a black line there that shows the efficiency from the uh, uh, standard 52.2 test on this filter in the lab. And you can see that some are performing pretty close to the way the filter performs in the laboratory, but a lot are not, right? A lot are performing a lot lower in efficiency. And there's phase velocity and some other reasons for this, but one of the big ones is this phenomenon called filter bypass. So if you look at real filter racks in buildings, uh, including in most of our homes, the filters don't seal very tightly in space, in, in place. So you see small gaps around the filter. You see in this picture here, which is from an office building in Montreal, filters pulling out of the rack. And of course, air takes the easiest path. It will go around uh, uh, the filter rather than, than through. There's another thing that's important with filters. What happens to a filter as it gets dirty? And so this is kind of the classic way of looking at filter aging. Uh, and then this is a filter that's been loaded with different amounts of dust. And you can see as it gets loaded with more and more dust, its filter efficiency goes up because the dust that deposits serves to remove the, the material uh, that's, that's, that's coming. Uh, that's, that's deposited there. It serves to remove uh, future material. This is what happens in what most of the filters we use uh, uh, in, the, in the market. So this is a filter that started out at about the same uh, efficiency. And this is from a commercial building in Finland, actually. And the researchers after measured its efficiency after a week, after a month, uh, and, and so on. This filter is rated for a year of lifetime, although the research only goes to 36 weeks. And you can see it declines in performance as it ages. And uh, this has to do with uh, the filter has a charge that's put on it at the factory, an electric charge, and that gets discharged or mass. Uh, and there's a bunch in the literature about that. But we've known about this for a long time. And what's interesting from a filter standards perspective, this is from the same research group, a paper that's 30 years old. And uh, they tried loading a filter with different stuff 
and saw how its efficiency changed in the bottom panel there. And again, apologies for the reproduction. It's an old paper. I've never found uh, a clean copy of it. Uh, but uh, uh, you can see that, you know, when you load it with dust, it doesn't change that much in efficiency. And in fact, dust is what we tend to load filters with and filters. So we're not capturing this uh, with something like a MERV very much. So we did the exact same testing. This is the aggregate data from 20 homes. Uh, the lighter colored data are when the filter, uh, the lighter colored bars are when the filters are new. The darker colored bars were after three months, which is the recommended service life of these filters. And we tested a MERV 8 conventional filter. You can see that it didn't change that much in efficiency. There's a lot of variation because every house is different, but, but the average efficiency didn't change that much. But as you look at the electrostatic or charge media filters, which are the ones that have an E after the, their MERV number, you can see that they all decline in performance as they age. So that's, uh, so, uh, 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 and if we put all these things together, this is what we learned after running filters for a year. So we took, you know, those four filters, ran them for three months each in a random order in each of these 20 homes, and then this is what, what we call the effectiveness. And we've even cooked the books here to make the effectiveness look as good as possible by taking out some of the impact of sources. And what you can see here, and this is all compared to the MERV-8 conventional filter, that the effectiveness on average doesn't vary, especially for uh, PM 2.5, uh, uh, doesn't vary very much uh, from zero, meaning that it's almost like these filters weren't installed. And these are some pretty good filters, especially the MERV-11 and MERV-14 filter, and it didn't change the concentration. In this particular sample, it was because of relatively low runtime. We did this in 2017, which was a pretty mild weather year in Southern Ontario. But the short answer here is that, you know, just having a good filter is enough. You have to use it. Well. You know, a lot of times people feel like I'm being negative about filtration. I was just part of a group at the National Academies where we uh, uh, wrote a report, a consensus report on practical mitigation of fine particulate matter. Uh, uh, for the part of the report I worked on, we found uh, uh, about 70, low 70s of papers uh, that where people had measured a health effect associated with filtration. And most of those papers found that filtration improves health outcomes, but there was a lot of variation. So a lot of those papers said it might improve this health outcome, but not that health outcome. Uh, uh, and so, um, so you know, the context really matters. How you use filtration is, is, is really important too. So I always say, you know, install a good filter, install it properly, make sure lots of air goes through it, change it frequently and verify it for its performance. And I'll talk more about verifying performance a little bit later. I also want to mention a few things about room or portable filters that we began used a lot during the pandemic. The test methodology is a chamber test, this time done by the American Home Appliance Manufacturers Association. And if you've heard of the clean air delivery rate or CADR, this is the test that comes from. Uh, the clean air delivery rate is the volume of clean air that a filter delivers. And so that's really important, uh, but there's a lot of, of, of things that happen when we use portable air cleaners. They can be very noisy, so people turn them off. They can do what's called short circuit, where they locally clean the air near the filter, but not in the broader room. Uh, they can cause resuspension, so some filters kind of blow air uh, uh, out the sides, and that can cause particles that are on the floor, including those that might contain infectious material go into the air. Uh, the placement really matters, and as a, a, an example of that, this is some work that a colleague and I did uh, uh, a long time ago, where we had a test house, and uh, uh, we took a particle source and took the same air cleaner and put it in very different locations, and what determined the air cleaner performance was less the air cleaner and more where it was in the house relative to the source. So placement really matters. And of course, like with uh, uh, central filters, you have to change. Them. So I would say, you know, use a properly sized air cleaner. And if you're using a kind of a, a, a well-regarded manufacturer, they'll tell you the size of the room that it's that is appropriate to uh, clean and uh, make sure you're putting it 
placing it correctly, which is either near the person or people you want to protect, near the source, or if you don't know, in between. Uh, so somewhere in the center of the room, don't put it off in a corner. Uh, and uh, you also have to train the occupant how to use her. The story I usually tell is uh, uh, my daughter during the pandemic when we when they first went back to school. Uh, you know, she knows what I'm interested in. So she came home from school one day and said, hey, we got to have a filter in the classroom. I'm like, oh, that's great. And then I asked her about it about three or four days later. I said, hey, how's to have the filter doing? She said, oh, yeah, we turned it on. Uh, and so that's the reality. So you have to tell people, okay, this is going to make noise. That means it's working. So, you know, turn it up uh, uh, when you can tolerate the noise. If you turn it down, make sure you're using other measures, other layers of protection. Uh, there's usually some discussion about ultraviolet light. Uh, I thought I'd talk a little bit about it. As with everything, there's an ASHRAE standard. The usual way we have used UV light historically has been in HVAC systems. There are kind of two ways we use in HVAC systems. One way is to keep, keep a coil clean. Because you're constantly illuminating a surface, that really doesn't do anything for what's in the air. Or we can have, if you've been in a modern hospital, uh, uh, we have very bright UV lights to treat the air. Uh, and, and you know, UV light can work. It's got some challenges. Uh, a lot of things degrade in UV light, so you have to think about what kind of uh, materials you're using. Uh, UV light can be very damaging to individuals, uh, and so if you've been in a modern hospital uh, uh, where whenever they open up the area in order to service it, where there are these UV lights, uh, the light shut off uh, to protect uh, uh, people. Uh, UV is uh, how well it works is a strong function of the airflow and how much humidity is in the air. Uh, so generally, slower air and drier air works much better for UV light uh, than other conditions. In some UV lights, especially cheaper UV lights, can emit ozone. Ozone is a respiratory hazard, and so on. It's something we want to avoid. We can also use UV in an upper room configuration, and I'm told it's in in this building or in part of this building. Uh, 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 and the idea of this is that you have a zone up near, it's sometimes above a drop ceiling or sometimes just high on the ceiling that has UV light. That UV light doesn't make it into the space. It illuminates that zone. And then you have some way of making air go through that space to treat it. It can be a, a nice uh, option if you have the resources to do it. So I think it's really important to talk about some case studies just to make this a little bit more concrete. So this is a famous uh, restaurant in Guangzhou in China. Uh, and uh, this was relatively early in the pandemic. And basically what happened is uh, an individual uh, had COVID, went to this restaurant and uh, people at two neighboring tables as well as at their own table got COVID uh, from that single index patient. And what was going on in this space, and you can kind of see it in the picture at the back is that there were these mini split air conditioning units that were circulating the air. And so what was happening is that uh, the air was being pushed from one table to the next. And in some cases, that was the infected individual's hair that was being pushed and breathed in by people at the other tables. The other part of the story that hasn't received a lot of attention is that mini split air conditioners, I love them. They have a lot of advantages, but because of the fans they use in them, you can't really use filters at all of any consequence. So they don't work very well. And so there was not filtration going on in this area, which might have helped them to protect some individuals. This is a study that I was involved in. This was an apartment in Austin. This is from 2020. And uh, there's just a mother and an infant living in this apartment. And uh, uh, we went in, or my colleagues went in, uh, uh, you know, months after uh, their infections had cleared and just took both dust samples and swab samples. And every time you see a, a green, it means it was negative for the RNA that causes the virus. And every time you see red, it was positive. And there's lots of stories we can learn from this, but two that I wanna focus on. One is that it spread everywhere in this space. And so, for example, the air filter, which is in the, uh, uh, in the this region right here, um, uh, it was a very low efficiency filter, but it still had a bunch of the RNA. Uh, 
the other thing that's interesting here is the, the mother who lived in this apartment, she was kind of uh, fastidious about cleaning, cleaned a lot. And, uh, you know, so you can see that some surfaces, uh, probably the cleaning removed the RNA, but some like the TV in the living room, the TV screen that probably doesn't get cleaned very much, or the handle for the toilet, the flushing handle on the toilet, uh, were both positive. Uh, and now this is not representing an infection risk. This is months after, but the RNA presence suggests that at one point it might be infectious. Uh, this next story involves me. Uh, and so uh, Zoe Hoskin, who's a PhD student that I co-advise, she's been doing a study looking at presence of the RNA, the, the COVID, as well as some other virus RNAs in different types of environments, including residences where people were isolating with COVID-19. And so she set up sampling little air cleaners that sample uh, in wherever the person was isolating who had COVID in the hallway right outside and then in a living area on a different floor. And uh, the blue is me. Uh, uh, how say I got COVID in summer of 2020, uh, sorry, summer of 2022. And uh, I was evidently a super emitter uh, for COVID. Uh, so very, very high RNA concentrations. In fact, these are, I mentioned the highest I've ever seen were uh, uh, where people were taking out their PPP, PPE in a hospital in Wuhan. Uh, uh, where the doctors were, the second highest is, is in the space where I was isolated. Uh, but the point I want you to take from this is that isolation, you know, it's true in the other houses, but you can see it more clearly for me. Isolation really works. You see much, much lower concentrations, uh, even in the hallway. There wasn't even a door outside where I was isolated. It's in our basement. Uh, uh, and by the time you got to the living room, which is directly upstairs, concentrations were so low that they were kind of questionable about whether uh, they were within our detection or not. Uh, the, the last case study I want to talk about is, is in classrooms. So U of T did this massive effort to uh, make classrooms nominally safer uh, by using ventilation, filtration, and portable filtration. So these are the students in my sustainable buildings class in April of 2022 writing an exam. The room is far too small. Sometimes that happens with exams. Uh, but but uh, uh, the other thing I want to point out here is there are portable air cleaners. This particular space doesn't get a lot of ventilation. It uh, uh, doesn't have a lot of central filtration, so they use portable filters. But look where they're placed. They're on one side of the room. So some of the people in the room are getting potentially cleaned air and others are not. Uh, and that's the reality. So um, I'm kind of towards the end here. I want to kind of put some of this together. So the first comment I want to make is we really need to verify performance. So this is some data from a classroom that I taught, taught indoor air quality in. And the university said that they had improved the overall removal of particles to six air changes now, meaning that the air in the room, the particles in the room would be removed in, in one sixth of an hour. In, in 10 minutes. Uh, 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 with, uh, and um, uh, this was done through a combination of ventilation and filtration. So one of my grad students, Bo and Du, kind of developed an approach where we could look at this actually in situ. And so we measured it. We measured it over a couple of weeks in November. And what we found here is that there was a really big gap. The university said we we're getting six air changes an hour. We we're actually measuring a little under two air changes an hour. And that gap comes from some from ventilation, probably the outdoor air dampers weren't behaving as they should. Uh, but a lot of it comes from filters not behaving as they should. So it was probably either the declines in performance because of aging, airflow issues, uh, or, or filter bypass issues. And we've now done this in about 20 classrooms at U of T. Uh, the university is not such a fan of this work, so we kind of do it in a guerrilla uh, uh, fashion, and some we've done for months. And we're finding a very consistent story where the university says we've got six or more, in some cases up to nine or 10 air changes an hour. We're measuring numbers more like one to three, uh, actually. And so it's really important to verify performance. Another way that we're trying to verify performance, this is uh, some work done by Rafsan Nayan, 
And uh, what he did is he uh, uh, deployed uh, uh, an air cleaner test approach where he took portable air cleaners. There's two different portable air cleaners here shown, one in the graph on the left, one in the graph on the right. And he operates for about a week uh, I, uh, going back and forth between a couple of hours running with the air cleaner and then a couple of hours with a placebo air cleaner, one that looks like an air cleaner and so on. And there are two very big messages here that you can get from either graph. The first message is the very same air cleaner will perform very differently in different environments. And that's really important, right? So there's no kind of one size fits all here. But the second thing, you can get that by looking at any individual uh, uh, color uh, on, on either plot here. There's this really wide distribution. In the same environment, sometimes an air cleaner is performing quite well, other times much less well. And so I believe that this type of testing, this in-situ testing is really important because you have to demonstrate to people, okay, what we're doing is actually working uh, to protect them. And I think we need to see a lot more of this. Part of that is having a standardized approach. So last year, ASHRAE came out with standard 241, which is meant for the control of infectious aerosols and, and, and harkening back to something I mentioned earlier. If you apply this standard, you're supposed to reduce the risk of infection by, by 95%. Uh, and you can achieve it through any mix of UV, central filtration, portable filtration, ventilation, other things too. It's got an appendix in it that lets you measure it using approaches similar to what I just showed you. Uh, but the idea here is that we can, we can reduce the risk and there are standardized approaches for doing so. So I hope we'll see much more adoption of things like this uh, going forward. The other thing is indoor air quality, because of all the myths and things that I mentioned earlier, there's really kind of a lack of good information. And um, it's not so much there's a lack of good information, but that people don't always know where to find that good information. So this is a, a, a book that ASHRAE put out. It's available for free in an electronic form. Uh, and probably 15 years or so ago, this came out. Uh, and it's, uh, it's called the Indoor Air Quality Guide. And uh, it's basically designed in two parts. The first part goes through about 50 different strategies for improving indoor air. Uh, and each strategy is designed in a way that's meant to appeal to clients and to architects, a lot of pictures, a lot of showing people how the strategy works. And then the second half of the reference tells you a lot of the details about how to do it and how to technically implement it. And so this is something that I actually use this as kind of a litmus test. If I'm talking to someone, uh, you know, a designer who is doing things with buildings and they're talking about indoor air quality, if they're using this reference or similar high quality references, I know that they're probably, you know, on a good path to improving indoor air quality. So this is something that I would encourage you to, uh, uh, to look at. And uh, the, the last piece of putting it all together is thinking about the communication aspect. So I mentioned that uh, a bunch of us were kind of dismayed that, that maybe Public Health Ontario was not giving good information. So early in the pandemic, we got together and starting at the bottom here, we started office hours. So any community organization, a community health clinic, a homeless shelter, a group home, uh, lots of different food banks, lots of different types of organizations could sign up and come for, for a half hour. And it would either be Myself, uh, uh, Amy Lee, another uh, person with similar expertise to me. We had several kind of advocates and public health people who would participate at various times. And they would just talk about their building and we would tell them some strategies that they could use to improve indoor air quality or there's a lot of talk about COVID specifically. Uh, and then we would follow that up with a letter. Office hours, we started to see a lot of diminished participation about a year or so ago. And so we changed over to, uh, we hired a grant writing consultant. And uh, there are several provincial and federal grants that these organizations can apply to. And she knows these grant opportunities and she works with these organizations to write a specific grant uh, to help them get some of the resources to improve indoor air quality. One of the things that came out of uh, office hours is people didn't have a lot of plain language guidance. So we wrote and we've updated it now twice and we're about to do a third revision 
uh, a publicly available plain language guidance. It's focused at community settings, but it's how to improve indoor air quality. Uh, and that's gotten, uh, I forget how many, but many, many downloads and uh, hopefully is helpful to people. And then last summer, we had the wildfires. And especially if you have underhoused or unhoused populations, there can be a lot of exposure to things that are quite harmful. Uh, and so we wrote a very rapid document on responding to events like wildfires to help uh, uh, protect some of these individuals. And so this type of information, there's a lot of similar efforts going on around the world, I think are really important to kind of make information available, especially to people who are going to be negatively affected uh, by it. And I'll finish here by, you know, at the, the Swiss cheese model, you know, I recognize that there's lots that goes on in any air, indoor air quality or infectious disease event. Uh, uh, it's not all the kinds of things that I think about, but um, what I do recognize is everything I knew what I know well, like ventilation and filtration is imperfect. And so it's really important to have these layers and to be very intentional about having these layers and making them as good as we can to protect people. I'll finish there. I'd be glad to take any questions. I wanted to ask, uh, I, I just to make sure I understood what you said correctly. My what I thought I heard you say was that the amount of infectious aerosols in an area where doctors are removing PPE is higher than even next to the patient. So uh, it has to do a little bit with, with how people have measured. So, but, but yes, very high, I would say with great confidence, very high levels where people are taking off PPE. And that's because the droplets all get on the PPE. And then when you start taking off PPE, it causes resuspension of those going through the air. Now, the piece that makes it a little bit complicated, um, I was a little bit mealy mouthed with my words, uh, is that the RNA is present. Whether that RNA is infectious or not, so you can find the genetic material, but it can no longer have the ability to convey infection. That's actually unknown most of the time because measuring infectivity is actually really hard. Measuring the presence of the RNA is hard, but much much easier. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but we do have some really interesting. The paper that scared me most during COVID, it came out in summer of 2020. A reporter called me uh, uh, and, you know, sent me the paper while we still embargoed and said, hey, what do you think about this? Does this concern you? I'm like, oh my God, it's terrifying. I mean, what the paper was about was about influenza A, one of the viruses that causes flu. And uh, uh, they did this very clever set of experiments uh, with guinea pigs and guinea pig bedding that showed that the virus could be transmitted through resuspended droplets. Uh, uh, and so the flu is hardy enough to deposit on the surface, come back into the air, for example, from PPE and still convey infection. Um, it's unclear still to this day whether most variants of COVID can do the same thing. COVID appears to be a little bit more vulnerable. It might not survive that resuspension process, uh, but some people say it can, some people said it can't, I don't know, uh, but um, I think we should because of influenza and probably things like RSV and other similar viruses, we should assume that it could be infectious. Yeah, and then I have a question. Could you speak a little bit about uh, far UV and how there are concerns about its interaction with the indoor air environment to produce ozone and yep. other contaminants? Yeah, so far UV, so UV, in, if it's high quality UV, is uh, probably a number like 254 nanometers. It's the wavelength of the light. And once you start getting close to 238 nanometers, yeah, you're in trouble because 238 nanometers, if you put 238 uh, or smaller wavelength light on oxygen molecules, you'll produce ozone. Ozone is a respiratory irritant. It's also a chemical oxidant. It does really bad stuff in doors. We definitely don't want it. So one comment I'll make even before talking about far UV is there's a lot of kind of cheap UV stuff out there. It uses relatively cheap bulbs. They have a big wavelength distribution. So they are generating some ozone. And I've certainly measured that as well. 
Okay, so FAR UV was meant to be a really nice solution to um, to uh, uh, to UV um, to to providing UV. It's two twenty nanometers, so it's shorter in wavelength, uh, two twenty two. Uh, but the other thing about it is that uh, it it's still very helpful for getting rid of uh, or, or destroying RNA and DNA. But it doesn't penetrate very deeply in the skin or eyes. So it's much less likely to cause damage. So people like it. The other nice thing about it is it's relatively easy to do with LEDs. You can do it quite efficiently. The problem with it is you'll note that the wavelength is less than 238. So it does generate some ozone. And so I've only seen two papers in the literature that have actually done a reasonable job of measuring ozone and both found relatively high ozone emission rates from far UV. I have heard that there are new technologies, for example, um, using very low powered far UV in the fins on an air conditioning coil. So uh, you're just trying to treat a very narrow uh, volume of air. Uh, and so even though they are generating some ozone, they're so low powered, they're generating not enough ozone to be of concern. I have also heard that there are manufacturers that are developing devices that treat the microorganisms of UV and then treat the ozone uh, before it goes into the space. And so I think there's a lot of promise in the technology because it is very effective, it is safer, uh, and so on, but the ozone concern is a big one. Thank you. Um, just to understand, I, I've heard. I think I misunderstood. I just want to verify something. What I heard from you earlier during the presentation, I think you were saying that, like in a residential setting, UV lamps appear to have, like in a ductwork, right? A central UV appear to have little benefit. Yeah. What's the what's the cause of that? So two things. The first one is that most of the UV lamps that are sold for for even office buildings let alone residences, are a different type of UV. They're designed to illuminate the, uh, the cooling coil, and they stop the buildup of fungi up the cooling coil. And that's a great thing, but it doesn't do anything for the air flowing by. There's just not enough intensity to actually change it. So that's issue number one. Issue number two is that, like everything in indoor air, there's not a lot of uh, regulation or a lot of control on the space. So in the residential market, you get a lot of without putting too fine a point on it, not very good. Uh, and so uh, it's just that, you know, in something like a hospital, it's a certified product, it's expensive, uh, it's very carefully designed, you get a very clear spec sheet on it. That's not the case in a lot of other regulations. So I, I'm an advocate for the technology, but it has to be done. Then I have another question about the electrostatic charge on air filters. How is that made? And is it possible to recharge a filter then after use? Great question. Uh, so the short answer is it's done in the factory uh, with a coating basically on the filter, uh, in a charged coating. Uh, there's a bunch of different specific technologies, um, uh, but that's fundamentally how it's done. Recharging. Um, is done. So there are some devices that use an ionizer to constantly charge the filter. Um, I feel a little bit mixed about those uh, uh, because on one hand, I think that's a very clever solution. You can start with a relatively low efficiency filter and make it perform much better because you're constantly charging particles. So you're gonna get much higher removal. And by the way, that removal is particularly important in the kind of sub one micron size, which is the, the size where you see that the kind of bottom of the cube usually. So it's, it's, it's quite a good thing. The problem is that some of those devices also generate ozone or maybe the ions don't kind of escape into the air. And then, you know, potentially we start to see some of the negative consequences. So I think it's a balancing act. There's certainly manufacturers who are doing it really well. They design, you know, very high performance filters that maintain that performance, continually charge those devices are generally speaking relatively low energy. And it's really an elegant solution. You get much better performance out of the filter. Uh, they also do a lot to control. 
the ions and ozone and anything else that's emitted so they don't go into the space. There's also a lot of manufacturers who don't do any of that stuff and they're probably, you know, getting better performance out of filters and causing them. That makes sense? Yes. yes. And uh, to follow up on that, is it possible for a filter to lose its charge prematurely through improper handling or just extended storage? Um, yes and no. So really it's air flowing through it that's gonna contribute to the deionization process, but definitely there are always filter storage issues. An example is when filters are stored in a very humid environment or even an environment where they get a little bit of liquid water on it, that'll do a number on charge for sure. So you do see like, um, I always, uh, I'm not allowed anymore, but um, uh, I used to sometimes sneak into the mechanical rooms at U of T and show people the stacks of filters sitting there. You know, usually the mechanical rooms are on the roof. So you'd see kind of dripping water, dripping from the boxes of the filters. That's not a good idea. Uh, let alone, you know, for mold and moisture reasons, let alone other things. But, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, it, storage does matter, but it matters for those kind of more important kind of mold things than it does for the exchange. But the other thing, even in the paper I showed you from that commercial building in Finland, that loss of charge in some buildings, you know, you get a pretty big decorative. That was going from something like a MERV 13 or 14 down to something like a MERV 1. Uh, so that's a pretty big, and that was a serious filter. That was not a cheap disposable thing. That was one that was meant to last for a year. So that's a pretty big decline you're paying for, for you know, MERV 13 performance that you're getting for that performance. Um, because of those declines. So it can't happen very fast, doesn't always. And so, so I think by extension, it's safe to say that if you're wearing a respirator and it's rainy outside and you get wet, your best bet would probably be a chance to change into a new one. Yeah, so you can. that's a really good question and one that there is actually some evidence to support what you just said. But I would point out that the charge is really important in a respirator context for particles that are in the kind of sub one micron range. Okay. There is some infectious aerosol in that range, and it probably does matter. But a lot of what we're worried about, at least my read on the literature, is kind of one to three microns. And I'm not sure how important the charge layer is for that. So I would rather wear a, a, a wet or a used respirator than no respirator at all. Uh, but certainly better to wear one that's not the damage. Excellent. Thank you. Right. Thanks, everyone. I think that is it. Well, oh, thank you very much, Jeffrey. I'll just kind of close things off here if you don't mind. That was extremely interesting presentation, and I certainly learned a lot. I think all of us here did as well. Thank you to all that came in person and online as well.